put out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 428th edition of Energy Week with me and the amazing Tom Fennell in the flesh. <laughs> in and the flesh. I, by the way, am George Harvey. But Tom Fennell is the one who you, you just saw there. Tom's having funny with, uh, fun with the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> Every day I get I'm up. I'm trying to remember how to do this for the last Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's been a while a since year we've ago, been anyhow, huh? working. We worked in the studio a little bit last year. Yeah. Um, toward the middle of the year. We did. We had a big piece of big plastic piece in between. Of plastic yeah. between us. Um, every day I get up and go to the internet and do research on news for energy and climate change from the preceding 24 hours. For each article that I find that I think is interesting, I, I put together a synopsis, 50 f or 55 words and a link to the original. 10 to 15 of those are packaged into uh, posts, and I put a post up on the internet uh, at my blog, geoharvey.com. And Tom and I go through the uh, the posts. I'm going to put this back on the wall. We go through screen. the best of the blog. The best of the blog. We we talk about the 21 usually out of the three day. Uh, out of yeah, out of the Roughly. preceding week, uh, which is about a, a quarter of the ones that I put up, and. Um, and just talk about them, and uh, you can find them if you go to geoharvey.com. We're starting this week, uh, this week's report, today being the 22nd of July. We're starting it a week ago today on the 15th of July, and if you go to my blog, uh, you will see the, the um, articles. It's, you can just search through what's there. Or And that's... Some, some of them are worth, worth looking at. I'll some try of, to mention that. Some of the stuff we're and doing is... And if you is push on the link on that, what George was talking about, the original article will come up. Yeah. And some of them, like I say, are very well worth reading. Yep. And you can also download or view the, the um, script that Tom and I use to, uh, to do the show at wherever you're, you have picked up this particular video, which if it's at BCTV, you scroll down and it's there, but it's put up on YouTube and elsewhere. Well, we have received uh, communications from people who in, in England who have seen the show. Yes, that's right. <laughs> England and Scotland, and um, we, one of the donations that we got came from, from people living in Indonesia. Good for them. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I think when, when this show went out looking for donations to, not to us, to BCTV. To the TV station. To the TV station to, to help support I mean, it. we're both independently wealthy. Oh, yeah, we're both independently <laughs> wealthy, which is why I drive a, a Mercedes, and, which is mine well, is brand new. I do new. drive a Mercedes, except well, it's 45 years old. Yeah, and it runs on on donut oil or vegetable oil vegetable from oil. restaurants, yeah. And my it's Mercedes... It's, it's interesting, I was looking at a uh, uh, documentary on Cuba. Yeah. And it showed Fidel Castro driving a car. Yeah. That was the car. It was... <laughs> <laughs> well, my Mercedes doesn't use any fuel at all. That's good. Well, it uses virtual fuel because it's a virtual car. Yeah. I can afford a virtual car because that way... I pay virtual maintenance costs and virtual they insurance costs. It can be expensive. Costs. Not <laughs> when it's virtual. It's, you can have as many cars as you want if they're virtual. Okay, we should start on this first item, which is um, an electric tugboat. And we can't get that picture up by itself yet, can no, we? No, we can't yeah. get it up by itself. I'm sa sad to say that this, we, this is our first time in the studio in months because of COVID-19. Yeah, we're still picking up the pieces here. You, you sort of, yeah. Anyway, you can kind of see back here. Well, as far as I can see, that's a small tugboat. That's a small tugboat. And I told you, well, let's let's de do the, the story first, and then we'll get that's into the explaining discussion. explaining why it's small. Yeah, this is uh, from Clean, Clean Technica. What do you have for title? 
Uh, what do I have? Meet E-Wolf, the little zero emission diesel killing tugboat <laughs> taking on big oil. Yeah, this is not going to be pushing an aircraft carrier around. Leading U.S. maritime firm Crowley has just announced it will build a tugboat called, called E-Wolf. It will build it, which um, will be the first all-electric zero-emission tugboat to ply the waters of the U.S. It is just one of three new diesel-reducing moves introduced by Crawley this year. And the comment that I've got on this is, this is the third first U.S. tugboat, electric tugboat I've read about in the last two years. The third first. The fir third first. <laughs> the other two were also the first, and they were different from each other. It was the first first and the second first. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And the funny thing about this is, I just wrote an article for, uh, for Green Energy Times about Elko, which is the company that manufactured PT-109, the famous yeah, PT yeah, boat that yeah. John Kennedy was on. They're going to make an electric version of it. No, they are not. But they, <laughs> what they're doing now is they're making motors, electric motors, uh, outboard and inboard, ranging from... It's a wave of the future. Yeah, and you know, I, I got very excited when I saw that. Well, it happens that in 2014, they put two 100 horsepower equivalent electric motors into a tugboat, which was designed well, maybe it to was be. Zoom around a little bit. Yeah, it was designed to be electric. They they just from happened the, to supply the, the motors. So it was designed to be electric for the get go. That's right, and it, it has been working on the New York State shipping canal since 2014. So these things have been around for a while. Um, but anyway, there it is. Do you have anything on that? Yeah, there's a couple of notes here. Tugboats don't need a lot of cargo space or living quarters. <laughs> yes. They just need power. Yeah. Okay. With the exception of the ocean-going tugs. Well, Those they still are, Well, yeah. They, they would they, need they, living they quarters. They need living quarters. A 6.2 megawatt hour battery will provide enough for two trips without recharging. They don't explain what a trip is. No, they don't. It replaces 30,000 gallons of diesel fuel a year. So they're doing a pretty, pretty yeah, good that, job. Yeah, that helps. And that's, yeah. that's, I got another yeah. note there, but it's rather irrelevant. Okay. So let's, let's move on. Our next on. item is from the hill. And if you can see the picture of that woman in the background, that is um, Jennifer, Jennifer Granholm. Granholm, who is the U.S. Secretary of uh, Energy. And, and what do you have for a... Title energy is. department seeks to cut costs of energy storage and boost renewables. Yeah, the DOE is trying to decrease the cost of energy storage by 90%. They can do it. Within this decade. We've got another story about this, which is, I think, actually more impressive. Well, storage is still in its infancy. Oh, yes, it is. I mean, they got, you know, I've seen the, the weirdest one was lifting up big blocks of, of rock. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and they're, they're letting them down when you want the energy back. Yeah, and they're actually doing that now. And, and filling coal cars full of rocks and yes, running them uphill. absolutely. <laughs> Let me finish reading this. Um, quote, we're going to bring hundreds of gigawatts of clean energy onto the grid over the next few years, end quote. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm said, that's the woman who was up behind us there, well, she, she says, we need to be able to use that energy, meaning the energy to storing, wherever and whenever it's needed. Yes. So the right. bottom line is the sun isn't always shining, the wind isn't always blowing. Yeah. So you, you still harvest the energy to store it. Actually, if we had the transmission system, the, 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 the Somewhere new, the new yeah. transmission systems are so efficient in moving energy around, moving electricity, that you could you could cost effectively produce en energy anywhere on Earth and but ship it to anywhere. But we're not going to be needing transmission no, systems. No, you're absolutely the right. The grid is going to be distributed. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Okay. Guy's, guy wants to invest in solar. He's going to put them up in his own field and then look That's up right. to the grid right there. Yep. And now we have a picture of wind turbines, and an article from CNN. Is that what that is? That's a yeah. wind turbine, huh? Well, I think there's a bunch of them there. Looks like it. Looks like more than, more than yeah. several. Yeah, we have more of those later on. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see if we're, I'm still getting used to working with these things. So. Yeah, why don't you put somebody other than me on the screen? Put both of us, or even you. You can put yeah, yourself put, on the I've, screen. 
Putting both of us okay. makes sense because you can see the picture. That's right. Although Brian is going to splice these pictures in later. Oh, cool. So, you know. Well, the EU unveils an ambitious climate package as it cools on fossil fuels. Yeah. It's not talking about climate cooling, it's talking about attitude cooling. Yeah. Last month, the EU, that's a European Union, enshrined into law its target to reduce emissions by 55% by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. But now it has unveiled an aggressive 10 step program titled Fit for 55. It is a roadmap for how the EU will achieve the reduction, and it looks to be fundamentally transformative. I got to say, I've read other articles about this that say yeah. it is, it is, it was done with a real eye to making sure that the fossil fuels industry doesn't hurt too much. Well, this is pretty comprehensive. Yeah, it touches on almost every area of economic activity, mm -hmm. from on one hand, from how citizens heat their homes, and commute to a total upheaval of manufacturing process practices. Well, we'll have to I see. mean, they're, they're, they know what they're doing here. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens. Well, the, in, the, in the article, there's a list of the Fit for 55 proposals, if you want to look at it, because mm -hmm. they're worth looking at. Yep. Okay, our next, our next item, we're, we're up to Friday, July 22nd. So soon? So oh, soon. I love this picture. <laughs> I, I found We've this. We've got to get this one out there. That, I love this one. I, I uh, found this. You know, the, I, I go to the, to the internet to find pictures for articles that I don't like the pictures for or don't have pictures. And I came across this thing and I said, I got to use that for something. That's, that's a, I mean, it, can you imagine how long it took the guy to figure that out and, I, and set I, himself up? And, uh, I have no idea. I have no idea. This well, article. It didn't happen overnight. No. This I item is from Clean Technica. I think that's an acacia tree. Oh, that's nice to know. I know I it's not it in my backyard. It's, it's an unusual tree, but I think it's an we acacia. We have unusual trees in you a, do. At, at my house, yeah. Yes, yes, you do. My landlady and I have share trees, and we have about, we have four different kinds of lime trees, and we've got kalamandans, which look like <laughs> oranges, and we've got le a Meyer lemons, and we have three different kinds of figs, and we have olives. It's it's an interesting place. Well, this is called protecting the next generation. Yep. Climate change has been ignored in the Australian media, which, by the way, is controlled by Rupert Murdoch, until recently. Now it is being mentioned, but highlighting the danger and provoking fear. <laughs> Well, you know, they, they, <laughs> there they, should be fear, but yeah. But, but, but the attitude of, the, of some media is, I'm going to, I'm going to produce whatever news makes people buy the news. Well, that's what it's all about, and bad uh, news sells. Our young may be bombarded by horrific f scenes of heat waves, fires, and floods, and that's something that we have to be careful about. I, I have to say, the pictures that I've seen from Australia, you know that poor koala bear that caught fire, you know, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's... Well, it, they're having a lot of trouble with fires. They are, and so are we. Well, they have relatively more. Well, I'm I mean, not so sure know, of that any, anymore. I say anymore. relatively. Yeah. Okay, should, should we go on from this, or do you have something to say well, about it? Well, the argument, this is my notes here, the argument could shift from, quote, there's no such thing as climate change, to... <laughs> Quote, it's too late or difficult or expensive to do anything about it. That's nonsense. Yes. Although we're a long way behind, a lot is being done. Yes. But that's we have true. to get actions in place to stave off the worst. Yes. You know, we're talking about it, but we're not doing enough about it. We're not yet. doing enough about it yet. Yes. Okay, our next item is from CNN, and we have a picture of. Well, the mess after a forest fire. Kind of a, kind of a picture of a forest fire, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Wildfires have scorched almost a million acres across 12 states. About they one... Didn't even mount, they didn't even count Canada. No, they did not count Canada. Uh, about a million acres have been scorched in 71 large fires across 12... Across uh, or complexes across 12 states, the National Interagency Fire Center said on its website. In Oregon, 
The massive bootleg fire, the country's w largest wildfire, has already charred big. more than 220,000 uh, acres. Now, it's, it's gone far worse than that. And in yeah. today's news, there, and actually yesterday's too, I think we might touch on this, I don't remember. Um, they're, they're the air quality in New York City is the worst it has been in 15 years because of the wildfires of it, yeah. in Oregon. I saw a map that... Uh, yeah, the smoke is going from Oregon to New York. Yes. And if you look at the map, it's like it's not going any place in between. <laughs> it's going straight to New York. I don't know how it gets to New York. It might be going very high and then coming back down. Or it might be that it's going into Canada and coming back south. I think one south. of the uh, articles we're going to talk about has those maps in Okay. It. All right. You'll have to look, look them up yourself, you know, click yeah. on, on it. Yeah. Uh, um, there's one of them that it, it's a, how would you say it, a movable map or a, okay. uh, I can't think of the right word, but interactive okay. map. Interactive map. We have to, have to kind of keep pressing ahead on this. Do you have we more on nice that? Pic no, I don't. We got a nice picture of Schuld in Germany yeah, before the flood. Before the flood and after the flood. It's, we don't have a picture of it. We but, don't have uh, a picture, but it's very sad. Most of what you see in there isn't there. Yeah, it's very sad what happened to that to that little village. Okay, this item comes from BBC. At least 80 dead and hundreds unaccounted for in a German flood. And there's pictures in, in a map in this article. Yeah, and the number of dead that is known, I think, is it's more than 80 double now. that now. At least 80 have di people have died and hundreds more are unaccounted for in Germany after some of the worst flooding in decades. That's just Germany. That's just Germany. Record rainfall in Western Europe caused rivers to burst their banks, devastating the region. Political leaders have blamed the flooding on climate change. I don't think there's any question that this is partly the result of climate change because we know. Well, it is, but that the, the, the people who are responsible for climate change don't want us to know that. Well, we know that the, the air is warmer. We know that oh, yeah. the warm air holds more water. You know, I mean, it just, yeah. So you have any more on that? Just that uh, as of this writing, at least 120 people died in Western Europe, and it's more than that now. Okay, we're up to Saturday, July 17th, and we have a picture of a wind-powered ship. This is very interesting. This is very interesting. Those round things there are the sails. Yeah, they look like... Smoke, funny smokestacks. And I was trying to figure out how they worked. <laughs> well, and it turns out there's three different kinds. Oh. Those round ones rotate. Yeah. And in rotating, they bring the wind yes. around. Then they got another one that's shaped like an airfoil, like an airplane. Wing. Right. And they got a third kind that's sort of in between. And I can't figure out how it works. Well, the, all, do you know how these work? The one that are basically cylinders? Yeah, as they're turning, they, they cause uh, an, an effect of the wind that's different depending upon which side the wind is coming from relative yeah. to the turn of the... Yeah. So they, they can aim the ship by moving the, these, these towers around. Well, yeah. they don't relocate the towers, they change the direction, the direction that they're the, pointing. That they're, go that they're turning. Yeah, this is the I, same I got a effect. picture here, but I, it's the I same can't get it up. It's the same effect that causes a curveball. Yes, curve. it is, exactly. Okay, this is from Clean Technica, and um, let me read the, the synopsis. Answering the call for greening the shipping sector, a new generation of engineers and entrepreneurs is working on feasibility of several different wind-assisted ship propulsion devices with, and the full integration with the vessel tr uh, trading operation and fi with vessel trading operation and financial models. Well, at one time, all ships were moved by wind, except the ones that were rowed. <laughs> yeah, and now we're we're moving back, and the wind is blowing for nothing. Yeah. If you do it right, it's free energy. Yep. And it's going to cut your cost of shipping. Yeah, and you know, you, you don't have to know a whole lot about shipping. To you know, if you remember, um, if you remember anything about the Merchant Marine during the Second World War, for example, when they had the ships 
in convoys crossing the ocean. And I remember as a kid looking at these ships in the convoys and saying, it must take forever to get across the ocean at speed they're going. Because they were, you know, you'd have a convoy running at seven knots. Mm -hmm. This ship, I think, might be able to do seven knots. You know, this is the maximum speed of some of the ships during oh, the Second World War. Yeah, yeah, the convoy I, could not go faster than its slower ship. Than a ship. slower ship, right. And um, so, you know, we're, we're making progress on that. Okay, you have more? Well, no, I, I do have more, but I can't get it up. There's a picture of uh, one of these. Okay. These wind things shaped like a wing. Okay. So I was having fun trying to figure out how they work. Well, all right. <laughs> I'm our still next, not sure on there. Our next item goes back to Germany for the floods. And this is, um, oh, isn't that, that amazing? It does not look good. No, it, it is not good. And as a matter of fact, the previous article on these floods had a had a uh, interactive photograph where you could do the before and after. It and did, yes. Before yeah. the before of this, that area that has collapsed, which is basically the lower right quarter of the screen, was farm fields. There it wasn't like even. A, it looks like a farm. Yeah. Yeah. There was not even a, a, a river, or a stream near this. This collapsed into a river that was at, at some distance. Well, you can see where the river. Is and where the where the farm field is is leading into it up in the up center of that. You know, I tried to figure that out, Tom. I don't think that is the river. I think the I think that is a is a road. I might be wrong. Well, but, whether it's a road or not, it's a river now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, this is from CNN. Record rainfall leaves over 120 dead in Western Europe. Devastating parts of Germany. Yeah. Catastrophic flooding has killed more than 120 people in Western Europe, with hundreds more missing, authorities said. Large-scale rescue efforts continue in rising waters, landslides, and power outages um, amid those things. Entire villages are underwater in Germany and Belgium. It's not just Germany and Belgium either. It, oh, no. It, no, the other, other but countries. But they got hit pretty hard. They got hit hard. Well, this, this article's got a good video. Yeah. There's good pictures in it, and there's a map. Okay. So this is one of the ones you want to bring yourself up to date. It's worth looking at. Yep. And a uh, little, little note here. The, the intense deluges were the result of a slow-moving area of low pressure, which allowed warm and moist air to fuel powerful thunderstorms and heavy, yeah. long-lasting rain. Now, Sort of what hit... It used to a couple of years ago. Well, we've, our next item is actually about some almost the same thing. This is a picture of monsoon clouds, and this is an article from CNN. Look like monsoon clouds to me. Oh man! <laughs> um, and uh, you know, this is we were we've been talking for for weeks about this horrible drought in the West, and now we've got this. Go ahead, Tom. What's the title? drought in the Southwest? could be making monsoon flooding worse. There's good videos in this, there's three maps in this, there's another one worth And an explanation out. of why the drought would make the flooding worse. Um, dr uh, monsoon rains brought extreme flash floods to the southwest this week, with scenes of vehicles bobbing down neighborhood roads like rafts on class three rapids. Experts say the historic Western drought is is to blame, making as I, as I well, finish what you were saying. Making the soil less like a sponge and more and like more pavement. pavement. Yeah. As I was doing this, <clears throat> as I was reading it and reading up on it, we were having extreme rain right here in Brattleboro. <laughs> yes. I mean, I looked out the window and it was coming down. Yeah. And uh, some parts of southern Vermont got hit pretty hard. Got hit pretty hard. We had warnings. I knew that, and then. It happened that uh, during the during the rain, what was I doing? I was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to know what a monsoon was. I yes. heard the word, and I looked it up. And a monsoon is traditionally a seasonal reversing wind. Okay, accompanied by changes in precipitation. Yeah. So the normal prevailing wind may be from north to south. The monsoon wind is from south to north. 
And in parts of the Southwest, this is how they get their moisture oh, yeah. into the ground. They have a well, monsoon every year. Certainly in India, that's the case. Absolutely. They, they depend upon it. They the depend on it. And there are people who depend on, on it in the United States. And, you know. Well, a monsoon season rainfall is typically sporadic in nature. Right. So you got bursts of downpours in some areas, and some other areas remain dry. They're a little unpredictable. Yep. Okay, our next picture is more of what's going on in Germany and the rest of the, the uh, uh, yeah, European look Union. The, look at that picture there. You can see sad? on the... Uh, well, that's on a canal. Yeah. And the canal rolls up. And I think you can see the high water mark on the, the side I of the building. I hadn't noticed that, but yes, on the second floor level. That's what it looks like. Oh, my gosh. Well, I could see looking at that that there had been windows on the first floor w level that had been... They're gone had been blown in by the pressure of the water. Yep, but, yep. Yeah, both of those buildings. Or and the buildings on the other side got it bad, too. Yeah, exactly. Okay, this is from DW. Scientists predict more extreme weather events in the future. Yep. And again, there's some good videos in this article, good pictures and a map. Over 100 people are dead, and many more are reported missing after daily f deadly floods swept large parts of western Germany. Such devastating floods have not been seen for decades. Meteorologists warn, however, that extreme weather events like this are likely to become much more familiar in the future. And I got news for you. We had weather problems last year. We had weather problems the year before. Yeah, but we got weather problems and now that are worse. they just seem to be getting worse. Yes, exactly. And I think that is the pattern that is going to go on for at least another 25 or 30 years. Well, we keep talking about global warming. We've gotten <clears throat> to the point where the deniers are pretty much squelched, but they're still out there. Yeah, they are. But we're talking about it. We're not doing enough. Not enough, no. Nowhere near enough. Nowhere near enough. Okay. We, we know what we got to do, but we lack the will. I think that's true. Our next item is from Clean Technia, and it's about a, 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 the... A, Aviation oh, Alice. That's, that's a nice, nice looking airplane. It's an electric it? airplane. It's a what airplane? Electric. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. And it says an aviation electric plane, and it's called Alice. Yes. Uh, in case you didn't notice. In case. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have for a title? Uh, 500 mile. Oh, no, I don't. I have aviation rolls out 100% electric airplane Alice's production version. A production version of Aviation's Alice Electric Plane has been finalized. Aviation is approaching the runway. Its first flight is planned for this year, and the goal remains to deliver the first customer planes in 2022. Well, That's pretty quick. There's two good videos and a lot of pictures in that. And one of the nice pictures is a picture of the interior of that plane. Yes. That's pretty plush. It's nice. <laughs> but it says here electric planes can cost, cut the cost of flying planes by 90%. Depends upon the uh, where you're using them. We'll, yes. We'll touch base well, on Well, there's that certain things up. that they haven't figured out for electric planes They're not going to be using them for New York to San Francisco for a long time. Not for a while. But from New York to Philadelphia, it's Absolutely. a bet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, but, aviation design is new electric to be new aircraft to be electric from the get go. Okay, so this is not a conversion. They started a, uses a 900 kilowatt hour battery pack, which is not a whole hell of a lot. And their goal is to undercut the cost of commuting by making the middle mile chips treat trips cheaper. Yes. Okay. Yes. Faster and cleaner. Yes. Okay, our next item is another one about aircraft, and that is not an electric plane that I've just put up. I don't think so. Um, and this comes from a publication called Simple Flying. Well, American Airlines commits to greenhouse gas reduction targets by 2035. They're not going to do it with that plane, but no. they are going to do it. Uh, American Airlines announced that it is the first North American carrier to seek validation from Science-Based Targets Initiative, a collaboration that includes CDP, the United Nations Global Compact, World Resources Institute, and the Worldwide Fund for Nature, which is known as the WWF. Well, you use the word science-based, and they're using it again. They're, they're aiming to implement a science-based target 
for reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2035, which is just what this article says. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I got a couple of reasons what they're using. But okay, I'm go not, ahead. I'm, I'm not going to bother you with it. Okay. We're going to move along. Our next item is from Clean Technica, and uh, we have a Honda. Well, it looks Hyundai. like a car getting plugged in, doesn't it? Yeah, well, they plug cars in now, but now you know, I haven't quite figured out how they can drive. They must have a horribly long extension cord. They do. Yeah, they roll up. The, oh, do they? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, let's let's see what my notes are saying. Yeah, let's Tesla do that. Model Three is the number one electric car in Germany in June. Well, All right. Yeah. That uh, was not terribly interesting to me in this article. Not really. But the but the synopsis is interesting. The German plug-in vehicle market scored over sixty-four thousand registrations this month last month, with sales rising fast. Plug-in hybrid sales were up 191% year over year to 31,314. By contrast, battery car sales were up to, uh, up by 312%. So they were selling twice as many plug-in hybrids as they had been selling. Yeah, and, and four times as many uh, uh, pure battery to 33,420 cars, which means that the, the, the ba all battery cars are outselling the hybrids now. Last month's plug-in sh share of the vehicle market in Germany ended at 24%, but with increases that they're experiencing these days, I, I wonder whether anybody's going to be producing gasoline or diesel-powered cars in two or three years. Well, it will happen. I don't know if it's going to happen in two or three years or not, but it will de it's definitely going to happen. It's inevitable. At some po point, it's going to be hard to buy gasoline because the well, cars are... The, the problem with electric cars now is the cost of the batteries. Yes. And as we've heard on this show, there's battery uh, alternatives popping up that are going to reduce that to 25%. Yep. Or something like that. Did we have a thing about, oh, what was it, Hyundai and, and Pan Toyota and Panasonic? Yes. Well, well, I think we got it today. We will get I to think that. We're to we it. will get to that. Because I got a quick note here because you. it ends a little bit of confusion here. A hybrid vehicle gets its energy simultaneously from a gasoline engine and a battery. Right. Okay. A plug-in hybrid won't tap into your gas tank until the battery runs out of power. Yeah. So it's 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 more of a uh, backup. Well, let's see. Plug-in hybrids have have ranges that they can run without without running the gasoline right and then they turn it on and then they turn it on and the ranges vary but you know they could be 10 miles or they could be 15 or 20 miles and of course a lot of that depends on how you drive your car but they're not really designed to be primarily battery powered they're designed to be it's designed to use both yeah but if you're just going to pop down to the to the supermarket that's three miles away. What do you need it for? You don't need it. You don't need gasoline. So the engine doesn't even bother turning on. Well, there's a there's a note here, I think. <laughs> well, I will read it, because a hybrid vehicle gets its energy simultaneously from gasoline engine and an electric motor. Yeah, okay. you read that, I think. Did I read that? Yeah. Well, this year, this year Tesla's Model 3 was the top seller, and that's not a hybrid. No, it's not a hybrid. It's test and they give a rundown on pretty near all electric cars, which right. is interesting to read. Our next item is from Clean Technica, and we're back to aircraft again. That is. It's another airplane. Yeah, looks that, like a World War II Mustang. Well, you know what it looks like. It's a 1930s era. Um, to me, it looks like a 1930s era race aircraft because they always had the cockpit way back at the back end. Because they needed all that room for an engine. I, I think that must be what that it was. That is it, yeah. <coughs> but anyway. Well, that's the spirit of innovation you're right. looking at there. What do you got for a title for the article? Rolls-Royce attempting a 100% electric aircraft speed record. Jaguar's ice pace offering ground support. Uh, Rolls-Royce is a familiar name in the early uh, development of electric aircraft market. It is, uh, it's fully electric aircraft spirit of innovation is about to attempt a new top speed record for an electric aircraft and it is aiming to fly this at over 300 miles an hour. 
Well, there's a lot of pictures in this article. If you like pictures, <laughs> pull it up because yeah. th I think there's like 50 pictures. And they it. have a lot of pictures of that car that's in the background. Oh, yeah. Which is well, a, that a car is electric too. Yeah, but that's is. that's the support vehicle. That's which tows the aircraft yeah, around. Yeah. When, you know, <laughs> this is so funny. Yeah. Let's see. More on that? Well, Rolls is working to deliver an electric passenger aircraft in 2026. That's coming up pretty soon. Yes, it is. And this is this is going to be commercial. Well, you know, the, that electric commercial aircraft that we were just looking at, they're talking about next year. Yeah. Okay, our next item, believe it or not, well, that right. is a wind turbine having its uh, rotor installed. Well, if you can look at that, there's a guy sticking his head out of the hole of the nacelle. You might say he has stuck his neck out too far. <laughs> <laughs> now, he's got a task ahead of him because he's got to connect about a thousand screws. <laughs> I know. They have so many holes that these, <laughs> these uh, bolts have to he's go He's going to be busy for a and while. He's he, probably he, still doing it. He's Well, he's probably got other guys in there. You know, as I think about it, they might even there's have room brought, enough. Yeah, they might even have brought up a small kitchen so they could cook hot dogs while they're doing this. <laughs> okay, this is from Renews. G20 urged to get serious about renewables. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Officers from companies in the wind industry, including Ersted, Siemens, Gamesa, and, and Vestas, called on G20 members to show leadership, finally, in the climate crisis by ra uh, raising national ambitions and urgently laying out concrete plans for increased wind energy production to replace fossil fuels. Well, the CEO sent an open letter to, letters, to the leaders of the G20. Yeah. Basically saying, you've made some progress, but, but not, not enough. enough. Yeah, it's very sad. Okay, our next item. Well, there's a situation, oh, there is a, a, go a ahead. takeaway here. Wind energy is the solution with the most potential to help the world meet its Paris Agreement targets. I, you know, I'm going to say wind energy, I wouldn't go quite that far because well, solar is going to go a long ways toward that too. Well, the problem with solar, and they can't resolve this, is it takes up too much real estate. I disagree altogether. Well, if they plant the right stuff under the solar, it doesn't take up any real estate at all. Yeah, exactly. We talked about that on the Many show. times. Agrovoltaics. 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 And, you know, I, I mean, the truth is the wind turbines can be... And we've seen this many times. They plop down in the middle of a pasture, and the cows just keep on grazing. You know, it's doesn't bother the cows any. They, no, it doesn't bother them. Um, well, were you with me when we went to visit the wind, yes. wind farm in, in western, yeah, western southern Vermont? What what is that called? Um, I can't. I'm, the name that comes to mind. I is, can't think of it. Is um, but it begins the, with the an cars S. driving by on the highway were making more noise than the turbines. Yes. And the cars on the main highway going downhill with their Jake brakes were the making trucks. about 100 times yeah, as much Yeah, they were. Noise. And when we went up and stood right among the turbines. We could talk. We could, not only could we talk, there was a person who was talking to us. You had your, your um, uh, what is it called that measures sound? My decimal meter. Yeah. yeah. And when he was talking, he was louder than the wind turbines. Yeah. And we were just right there at the wind turbines. So the, the idea that they make a horrific noise is, is you know, scare tactics. I used to live on a mountaintop. I could hear trains that were 10 miles away. You and can I do could, that around here. I could, yeah. I could hear tractor trailers that at, at a place in New Hampshire, and the nearest road that carried tractor trailers at high speed was in Vermont. Yeah. It was like yeah. four miles away. It was on the other but side of the But you were sitting on top of a hill. I was sitting on the top of a hill. And... If there had been wind turbines, I would have found I would have heard them, and they would not have been as noisy as that blasted locomotive that woke <laughs> me up every morning at two o'clock. Well, it, it shined said, its headlight through my window, and it oh. would go down three and a half miles of track with its headlight going through my window. And those headlights are so bright yeah, that from are. seven and a half miles away, I could hold <laughs> something up and read it. <laughs> You saved on your electric bill. Well, I didn't because I didn't read. I, I lay in bed with the, with the covers over my head and wished it would go away. And it would go by for two hours. Wow. Because it would go up the river 
and then it would go across the river into into New Hampshire, and then it would back down the track so it could switch to a different track. <laughs> and then it would go up again, and then it would go up the Ashwillet oh, River. Oh, they were making, they were creating a train. Yeah. Yeah, they were okay. putting together the pieces. Okay. Solar um, and wind provide 99% of new U.S. power capacity in April 93. In, in April. In April. 93.9 in May. Yep. So. Solar oh, power. They're, they're, they're taking over. Yeah. Solar power and wind power continue to dominate new uh, power capacity additions in the United States. Almost 100% of new power c capacity additions in April came from solar and wind. <coughs> and 94% of new power capacity additions in May came from solar and new wind. There was an article today, we will have it next time, which talks about um, gas uh, solar and wind in Australia. And it says that okay. in, in the Australian market, there were, there were 27 large gas-powered uh, power plants, which is the cheapest they could do. And because they were too expensive, they were shutting them down. Out of the 27, 24 of them were operating at 20% capacity. Because they were too expensive to operate. You can't do that and keep those plants going. They have to shut down. They are too expensive to run. Well, we've been finding that out on the show. I, I mean, guess. Uh, right well, now, solar is at, at par or, or better, and wind is getting there. Yep. We have to keep going, Tom. Well, uh, solar and wind. Did I read this? Yeah. Yes, I did. Okay, one measly megawatt of extra oil power production capacity blocked 100% for a figure. <laughs> <laughs> one measly megawatt. Yeah. But they haven't still caught up with coal. Okay, it's coming, but every wind and hydropower together haven't caught up with coal. I doubt that that's true. I think that's probably wrong. Anyway, we have to keep going. We've got an that's article. The, they're talking about the U.S. I know. Clean Technica. Uh, we have a picture of a Toyota BZ4X. And that's uh, interesting. It's, now notice it doesn't have a grill. Yeah, but how it does about down that? at the bottom. You got to well, they've, they've that's to cool the battery. Cool the battery, yeah. Um, and what do you have for a title from this? I gotta pull it up. Toyota and Panasonic. This is what we talked about. That's the one. Yeah. Joint venture plans to cut battery costs by fifty percent. By fifty percent. Now there's a nice three and a half minute video on this. That yeah. I recommend. In 2020, Toyota and Panasonic. Panasonic formed a joint venture called Prime Planet Energy and Solutions to manufacture advanced lithium-ion batteries. PPES said in a recent statement, it expects to lower the cost of batteries 50% um, by the end of next year. Well, the That's price is the, about 60% of the lithium battery cost is the lithium. Okay, and they're coming to the point where they're getting lithium a lot cheaper. That's okay, right. Okay, there's, I, I looked at the world's largest salt flat, it's in, I think, Bolivia. And it's, it's half salt and half lithium salts. Yeah, you should put us both up, I think. Half salt and half, li half lithium salts? Half there you go. Ta table salt, you know, sodium chloride yeah. and half lithium. And they're, 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 they're trying to get that lithium. Well, right well, now, Bolivia produces half of the uh, cobalt. All right, try this out for size. There was an article that appeared today, and I think we'll talk about this next week, too. Um, it said that there is, in the Salton Sea, you know the Salton Sea? Yeah, in California. There are, there are salt deposits there where they've, you know, they've got geothermal activity, brings, it, brings the salt up. I sent you an article about the Salton Sea. I believe you did. I will send it again. And well, we we have this in the news for next next week. That's why um, I was going to send it again. Well, I've got this. <laughs> you got everything yeah. you need. Um, and and the the article said that the the geo the the people who understand geology um, say that the salt and sea deposits could provide twenty times the lithium demand of the United States. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, anyway, um, let's see. Have we finished with a with a Toyota? 
Well, the plant output from this joint venture plant will be enough to power 80,000 cars a year. Yeah. Okay, our next one, we're back to aircraft again. They just keep coming up with Looks these airplanes. Looks like an airplane, airplanes. Yeah. And this is a heart. This, this one is electric. This is all electric. And, and you can a, see, I think you can see the motors. Yeah, you can. You, uh, yeah, the propellers are turning. Yeah, that is a rendering. It's not the actual aircraft. But this is from Clean Technica. What do and you that's, have for that's that? That's a Hart ES-19. Yeah. Hart is the name of the company. Yep. United invests in a Swedish air, electric airplane startup. Yes. Swedish electric airplane startup Hart Aerospace says its ES-19 will be ready to begin commercial service on flights of 250 miles or less by 2026. United Airlines, which obviously is, a, is an American company, agreed to buy 100 of these airplanes, the ES-19s, electric aircraft from Hart and anticipates leaving, uh, having them in passenger service uh, before the end of the decade. Well, jet fuel is about 50 times, has about 50 times as much energy by weight as batteries. Right. So that kind of eliminates them for long distance flights. Yes. Okay, but the short distance flights, they're going to take over. But you know what, Tom? I have figured out how to do it on long distance flights. Take a parachute along. No. What, you know, they're, they're talking about these... A trailer. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> you, you, they're talking about these vehicles that are, that are um, uh, autonomous. Yeah. All right, why not an autonomous airplane? You mean to refill them in air? Yeah. Could be done. You could do it. You could have could an airplane. You could fly this thing from, uh, from Boston, and just as you're crossing over Al uh, Albany, uh, an autonomous plane comes in and plugs itself into this thing to provide it with electricity. It could it be done. It charges it, and you get over to, <laughs> to Cincinnati, and it detaches and lands in Cincinnati <laughs> to charge up for a plane going the other way. You could do it. Okay, and now I won't well, tell I you, by the way, the I've been through the patent process. I don't want to do it again. I'm 75 years old. By the time it was done, I'd be 85. And by the time I got any money out of it, I'd be 137. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, they, they, have, they have found it's, it's economical to fly small numbers, like a dozen of passengers, over short distances. And this particular plane. And that's plane, going to be taken over. Yeah, this particular plane. That's going to do it. Has, uh, it has room for 19 passengers, which is why it's called ES-19. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, well, we're up to Wednesday, July 21st. A nice picture of the We have a picture there. of us. Oh, it's, it's, it's the sun. Oh, it's the sun. Yeah. Um, and this is an article from CNN. Well, you might notice in that picture that it's a little bit smoky. That's yeah. why I call it the moon. Well, you know, uh, when you see red, beautiful red sunsets or sunrises, it's usually because Sun. of particles in the air. Because, of, yeah. Wildfire smoke from the west's massive blazes stretches all the way to the east coast. The huge bootleg fire in Oregon has scorched an area larger than Los Angeles. And by the way, Los Angeles is bigger than New York City, even though New York City has five counties in it. You mean geographically? It's yes. It's, yeah. yeah. Well, I can uh, believe that. Well, and not only that, but New York City isn't even in the top ten. From a geographical area. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very, very compact. The four top biggest geographical cities in the United States are all in the same state. Are they? California? Illinois? Alaska. Oh, Alaska, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Did you read the title? You did, uh, and I read the, the synopsis. You have more on this? Well, there's good maps in this, and there's a video. Yeah. And it says, plumes of smoke reach so far up into the atmosphere that they are being carried thousands of miles by high-level winds. And I mentioned this earlier. Um, the, the, we will have an article next week that talks about the fact that the air quality in New York City is the, law, is the worst it's been in 15 years because of the bootleg Well, the last fire. sentence of my notes here says, in some areas the smoke has reached ground level, where it can be a health concern. Right. Okay, our next item is back to uh, floods in um, not just Germany, but worldwide. I was hoping you could, push, you could switch the picture of uh, 
Brattleboro with the floods. Oh. <laughs> we got a picture almost exactly like this with I know, Brattleboro. I know. You sent it to me, I've and it by that you. time I'd already sent the slides into BCTV, so. Okay. You know. Um, What's nice about that other picture, it's not nice, but my car's in it. <laughs> I lost oh, the car in it. Poor Tom. Okay, you've talked about that car. I remember bringing what do you have it, for a title for this? I remember bringing the car to the dealer, and his exact words were, it's toast. Yeah. The title for this thing is, Science scientists are worried by how fast the climate crisis has amplified extreme weather. You know, I just thought of a of a joke that we could build about you, around your car. Uh -huh. How do you make toast by getting something wet? <laughs> okay, until recently, climate change has been talked about as a future threat. Its front lines were portrayed as remote places like the Arctic, where polar bears were running out of sea ice to hunt from. But in the last month, it has developed world um, it, it has been the developed world on the front line. And there's Say that no, again, a developed world. This, in this the is last not month, Africa. This, this, is, is, this is the big this guys. Is not, this is not... This is the UK, this is the US. Yep, yeah, this is not Greenland and, no. and the Arctic and northern Canada and Tierra del Fuego. This is, uh, this is the United States and not just, you know, coastal United States, Chicago, um, inland inland places in Germany. Well, this, this, this is very interesting because they got almost 60 pictures and there's a pretty good three minute video called How to Save the Planet. Five simple things you can do in three minutes. Worth watching. One of the things that I think is, you know, since the Second World War there have been very, very few wars in Europe. Yeah. And there have been very few wars in North America. Yeah. And <laughs> I have thought of, given a lot of thought to that. You know, you have people saying, well, it's because of the nuclear bomb. I don't but think so. My sense is that a lot of the reason for that is because real estate, infrastructure, and so forth is destroyed by warfare. And getting yeah. it built up again is a, an extremely expensive process. And people don't like the idea of wars because they know that it destroys infrastructure. Well, I was just going to say there's profit in war. There's and profit in they, war, but the loss the is profit, many times they as take big. the profit away from the war, yeah. you ain't going to see war. Yeah, well, in, in any war, there's far more loss than there is profit. It may be that... Somebody else eats the loss. Yes, that's right. It's, it's, it's For the First World War, people were complaining about Krupp Industries. You remember that? Yeah, Krupp, yeah. And Krupp, Krupp. And, you know, I, I just, I don't, and of course, President Eisenhower warned us against the, the military industrial complex. That he did. But I think that, you know, anyway, uh, here I am complaining. Well, we got another picture coming up of some we, funny looking things. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we do, and I don't know what they are. They might there be, they, are, huh? they might be some kind of Propellers? monument. Well, you know, I think the way that this works is that if you put up enough of those and you put enough energy into them, they push the wind so hard that they change the speed that the world turns at. That could be. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't well, you put us both up? I think people are tired of me. You want to see both of us, huh? You know, you also want to see the wind turbines. And in case anybody didn't see it, that was the flood that we were just talking about. But here are the wind turbines. And... Um, Renewable projects could help G20, the group of 20 nations, find 22% of their 2030 targets. This is important. Just renewable projects that are, that are on the books already. They're on, on the books. And this is something that, um, that uh, consultancy.uk put up, and I didn't see it anywhere else, but I think it's important. According to strategy consultancy EY Parthenon, Around 13,000 renewable energy projects in nearly 50 countries are waiting for finance. That's all they're waiting for. They don't yeah. need to be given money. They need to they be loaned money. They don't have to do it. They're just waiting for somebody to pay for it. The if investors. these projects were carried to fruition, they would provide massive reductions in pollution and create millions of jobs. The article says 10 million. That's, that's million. So why don't we do that? You don't have to give them the money. You just have to loan them the money. Or I don't know. Not even I don't know. Guarantee the it. money. 
guarantee the loans. Now these projects they're the, talking about could produce a terawatt yeah. of, of, of electricity And the capacity. President of the United States could probably do this. If a really, terawatt is a thousand gigawatts. And a this is a thousand bigawatts. And as I say, <laughs> gigawatts is bigawatts, folks. And, you know, I think basically what this is doing is it's telling us we have got very, very close to where we want to be if we want to be there. We just have to develop the will to do it. And meanwhile, we've got floods, we've got fires, we've got drought, we've got, you know, all kinds of things. And the well, the article says there is huge potential to accelerate private sector renewables investment with the right government policies. Right. And that's the key right there. Yeah. You have to have the right government pro policies. Yeah. And in the United States... We don't. We don't. <laughs> and, and the government, not only do we not have the right policies, but our policies have been adjusted to be as wrong as they possibly could be. Yeah. From the point of view of how we get renewable energy in. Yep. So well, the oil companies are still big and powerful. Yes, they and are. Even though they're coming to realize that uh, you know they're not in the catbird seat forever, they're really doing, they're really trying to hold on. Well, as long that as thing they that can. I was saying earlier about the twenty-seven gas-powered um, uh, generators in Australia and twenty-four of them. That's a huge number. It is. Are operating at 20% capacity? That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I think... They're, it, they're not making money at 20%. No, they're, they're not making money. I mean, uh, you have fixed costs, and the fixed costs of these things don't go down if you produce less, uh, uh, less power. So you've got a serious problem there. If you're, if you're running it... I don't know. Those gas-powered plants probably have capacity factors that are upwards of 60%. In fact, they could be upwards of 70%, which means that operating at 20% capacity means they're losing money. their sales are a third of what they could be. They're losing money. Yeah, they're losing money. They need the capacity because it's probably where they are and when they can. They've probably signed contracts. Yeah. And, and, they, yeah. and they need to be able to produce that power. And also, they're probably using these things as batteries, basically, backing up the grid. But you bring you put in a you put in an actual lithium ion battery or you know a, a train that rub, runs up a hill carrying <laughs> stone up the hill and then you bring it back when you need yeah. the power and generate it from the wheels. That is stuff is cheaper. So wh what is the future of natural gas generation? Well, in Australia, a lot of the oil and not oil, the coal has been, had been gobbled up a long time ago by the big companies. Mm -hmm. And... Now it's turning into stranded assets. Stranded assets And is it's the word. turning in as we are watching. Yeah. And, you know, I mean... And they're people, not happy about that at all. People don't know, um, for, for example, that when Donald Trump took office, um, there were 50,000 coal miners in the United States. And when he left office, there were about 35,000. Well, he said he was going to protect coal. Yeah. <laughs> the Dow Didn't Jones work, Coal it? Index crashed and, yeah. and disappeared. They don't even but publish also, it anymore. No. The Dow Jones Oil and Gas Index was down 50% when he mm -hmm. left office. Wow. And so... But it's he, not, it's he not was, him doing it. The, yes. It wasn't... You can't say that he didn't try. Yeah. He did try. He may not have tried as well as he could have, but he did try. That's well, he was up against issue. formidable opponents. Yeah. Reality. Reality. <laughs> Bingo. When, when the price of ga uh, oil and, uh, f I'm sorry, of, of solar and, and wind and batteries gets low enough, there just isn't any point in war running a natural gas burn burning we're, power plant. We're at that point right now, we're, really. I think we're past it. Past? Yeah. In, in most, much of the world, we're past it already. Yes. So we have one last little bit of a slide here which says... Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> have a shockingly <laughs> copacetic week. Let's put that one up. And um, Tom and I, uh, Tom and I will wave goodbye because that's what we always do, even when we're you doing. You can see it, us this time. Yeah, you can see <laughs> us this time. We've talked about this for for months, literally, about how we wave goodbye. And I know that Tom and I both do it because we're honest people. <laughs> <laughs>
I certainly do it. I say I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I yeah, don't absolutely. care who watches it or not. Come back My next time. My cat can tell you. Huh? My Your cat, cat can tell you. absolutely. Tom is a very talkative cat. I hear the cat sometimes when we're doing the show. <laughs> <laughs> He's very affectionate. Yeah. Nice guy. Come back next time. And have, well, a, come back have a, a shockingly yeah. copacetic week until then.